Hello everyone, uh, great to see everyone in person again, and uh, thanks for joining us today. This is the location track for Palazzo, so we going to represent you the project and you know, the latest news since the last location track is probably not in the past. So, first, a little bit of information about us. Uh, this is Jason and this is my speaker, Luca. We are both core maintainers of Python and open source engineers at Sysdig. Uh, we have all kinds of Python and they write the AP support, value contributors, and making the project better. And we also give you know, personal contributors ourselves as well, uh, both code and non-code, and uh, also a couple of bugs every now and then. So you can find us on GitHub and Twitter, so feel free to reach out and say hi. First things first, what is Falco? Falco is a cloud native attack security tool that watches everything happening in your system and sends you an alert when something suspicious is happening. Falco was initially developed by Sysdig and eventually contributed in 2017 to the CSCI. So currently, Falco is well loved in the open source community, is recognized as a de facto standard for threat detection for Kubernetes, and it's an integrating level project in the CSCI. And currently, we are in the process of applying for graduation. Now, many security tools uh, decide to collect uh, security events, store them, and use them for you know, query and later inspection. Falco chooses a different approach. Falco watches the event stream at the right time and uh, you know, tries to detect security issues in the exact moment that it happens so that you can get identified uh, you know, as fresh as possible. And uh, when you receive a notification from Falco, you can you know, forward it to a bunch of different outputs so the Falco can easily be integrated with other applications in the ecosystem. And you can potentially react, store them, and just watch them. Uh, historically, Falco was designed for collecting events coming from the kernel because it's not the way Falco has visibility over everything happening in the system. So all the containers, all the processes, and applications run. Right? Um, this happened historically again uh, with either kernel module or EBDF, for which Falco is a great big adopter. And uh, recently, since one year ago, we were sure to up one of the software, we introduced a new plugin system that allows us to bring the power of the Google engine to cloud security in a broader sense. It makes you basically part of just uh, security events, you know, of all different kind. For example, we're able, uh, as you can see, to connect cloud to the AWS cloud trail and pull, you know, all the events from that platform to see everything happening in your infrastructure and write security rules there as well in the several language. The same goes for Kubernetes on the blogs and Okta, and there are many more in the list. Um, this, thanks to the plugin system, again introduced in version 0.31, which basically is a standard way for now to create and develop file extensions, which already has been greatly appreciated in the community. But of course, we didn't forget about system security, and there is active development on that aspect as well. And uh, you know, the GVisor integration uh, is a big knowledge that we introduced over the past, the past few months, which we will cover later. So let's start talking about what we are all here for, which are the novelties in the project since the last one years track. There has been plenty of exciting stuff, so let's go. Since Python was adopted through, we introduced official support to the ARM64 architecture. Now, many of you can say probably that this is not a big deal in 2022, and this probably came later than expected, but I can assure you that when there is current expedition involved, this is everything much real, and we had to know and efforts to achieve this, uh, this goal. But now we're all set. So from now on, whenever new font version gets released, we can provide you know, official packages, container images, and even plugin artifacts for both AMD64 and ARM64. Uh, and you know, many of you probably already know that we also provide a big uh, repository of pre-built kernel modules and APK approach for our, for our users to download instead of attending uh, local compilation of the system for different kind of versions uh, Linux distros. Now we support ARM64 for those as well, which greatly enlarges our compatibility in user systems. Another major change uh, recently is the way Fatal consumes and conceives these stream of schemes of events. So the best way to explain this is by taking a step back and looking at what Fatal had before the plugin system. So, Back in the days, uh, Falco used to support mostly only kernel events, and eventually we also had to support for Kubernetes on the blog. Uh, in C++, that was the design of Falco executable. So the two would actually run together, and users had you know, the choice to actually enable, turn on and off, each of them depending on the use case. But the way this was implemented was very hacky. Uh, you know, we could not standardize, and didn't have like great uh, safety measures for a perspective. 
or your deployment in this case. So this, for example, costs many users to run both system calls for action and Kubernetes on the consumption, both in the same instance, even when it was not necessary. So then when the plugin system was introduced in version 0.31, uh, we had a standardized way to create new event sources and potentially each plugin can implement a new one, right? A great example again is the AWS CloudTrail plugin that I mentioned before. So one other thing that we did in this version 0.32 was re-implement the support to Kubernetes on the blog as a plugin, entirely new, and uh, you know, with feature priority for what we had before, uh, which is great, much more maintainable and you know, uh, easy to read and develop for. But uh, there has been some differences from before, and the biggest one is that initially, with the plugin system, it was able to only run one open source per configuration. So, for example, if you wanted to do both system code collection and go in the best cloud events, you have to deploy two different instances of cloud, for example, which was not super handy and many community folks complain, uh, you know, because it wasn't different from what we had in the past for Kubernetes on the bus. So, since version 0.3, by the way, it was released literally a couple of weeks ago, uh, we introduced a standardized SA support for multiple open sources in the same platform instance uh, simultaneously running. So, Events and security detections are uh, all around in an isolated and safe parallel workload in the same platform instance with very little uh, overhead. And there is total feature parity between having many platforms, each configured with one event source, and one single pod running all those event sources in the same instance. Uh, this creates like a big like, new opportunity for new security use cases and also new deployment use cases and bad practices. Uh, one thing that we're proud to say is that we desire to develop this feature totally in the open with a great participation and discussion from the community. So if you're interested in you know, seeing all the basis goals and the design and discussion, you can check that issue in the link. Now Luca will go on with the latest updates. Thank you, Jason. So another feature that we recently introduced is support for Divisor. And you might be asking that what is Divisor? Not everyone is familiar with this technology. As a security person myself, I'm really excited about it because uh, it's a sandboxing technology. It's been developed uh, by the open source team at Google and it's used in UK, GCP, and Pentium, and uh, it's completely open source uh, and it can be deployed uh, in a variety of different systems, uh, including flavors of Kubernetes. So, and what does this have to do with Python? So, Divisor is a sandboxing, which means that it's going to make our containers uh, even more containers. Containers are, of course, already have uh, security properties, but the divisor is going to sandbox them even more, limiting the system code that they can do, and uh, actually emulating a part of the Linux operating system kernel in order to perform uh, actions more securely and uh, adding an extra layer of the file system emulation and also second boundaries. So this means that a lot of privilege escalations can simply not happen when running uh, uh, our workload on the device. This is great for a lot uh, of uh, high security workloads and high security use cases. But what if you can, if you want to also uh, observe the workloads? So not only we want to contain them, but we want to take a look at and see when something suspicious is happening at within within our containers, so for example, for compromised workloads or potentially malicious. We can try plugging in Falco, but Falco is not really going to, uh, to tell us a lot because Falco hooks into the actual kernel. And since Divisor has a Divisor kernel running in user space, what happens within that Divisor kernel will stay there and will not reach the kernel, the regular operating system kernel directly. So what can we do? Well, the, uh, thanks to collaboration with the open source team uh, that manages Divisor, we were able to create a, a new a way to plug an event uh, into, into Falco, directly into LibScap, so that not only Falco can benefit from it, but any open source project that uses the same libraries uh, code base uh, that Falco has. And in this way, we can uh, through directly through Unix domain socket in user space, uh, we can uh, have one instance of Falco running on collecting all information from all the devices sandboxes and forward them to Falco, so we can use the same draft tools. Uh, if you think about uh, maybe uh, exploitation and attempt, we might find that uh, A is blocked because of the sandbox uh, and also watched uh, because of our Falco. Uh, if you want to learn more, there are tutorials in our blog and in the device blog. So, uh, as a security person myself, 
I, uh, I really like seeing your security rules even in the default. I love when a process doesn't open that contains too many dots and slashes to be legitimate. And also when a process tries to you know, take a look at other processes, um, environment variables that are not just environmental secrets. And so I, uh, I'm very grateful for the community for these rules. And, uh, we, uh, and also we are all very grateful for a cleanup of the rules uh, that uh, got us much better performance uh, in the, for some use cases uh, that have some rules enabled and some disabled in the later versions. So now I would like to talk to you a bit more about the libraries, the same Libscat kernel module and libgit problem because uh, those uh, are used by some products that are not necessarily helpful and uh, uh, we are improving them a lot in the photo community recently. Uh, actually, it's the most exciting time to, uh, to work on the libraries because we are seeing the uh, highest amount of contributions to the libraries ever, even before the contribution of the libraries themselves to the CNCF. So now we really there's a lot of people from different, uh, from different organizations that are contributing a lot of code issues, uh, features, uh, issues called, uh, and uh, many other things to the top of libraries. Uh, this is very exciting and uh, it's, really, uh, it's really a pleasure to work, uh, to work with this library now, but uh, it comes with a little bit of a price that I want to illustrate with a little quote from our, one of our containers and contributors that exist uh, downstream. They were saying every time we pull from your forks, we get some quote unquote surprises. So I'm sure they were so pleasantly surprised by the new syscalls, by the uh, performance, by everything, but uh, I think some of those quote unquote surprises were not completely pleasant uh, and uh, were not completely joyful. And uh, as a part of the community, we understand because there are more clients, more people that want to use the library, more changes, and so we need uh, to do some cleanups to the lips themselves. So we've got uh, uh, now versions for everything. We've got user space, we've got kernel space, uh, they both get their versions, and since we're, the, we're just there adding version numbers, so we've got versions for the interface as well. So when you load the driver, maybe in an incompatible client, you get an error instead of a crash. So what? And uh, we added more testing to the libs themselves. Before, historically, the clients like Falco or other downstream had tests about the libs themselves, not so much. So, what should we test first? And with what's the most critical part? Well, it turns out that the system software, so everything is critical. Uh, we've got uh, critical performance uh, problems so when uh, we pull a lot of events, and we've got kernel code, we've got EPF. So, uh, where should we start? Well, let's start with all of it. So we've got an end-to-end -end testing framework that allows us to just run some programs and see the output line. But this is great, but it has a little bit of a drawback because we are testing the same system that we are instrumenting with the kernel module. This is, might be a bit philosophical, but it's, it can get utility tests sometimes. So we also added uh, integration tests for the parts in isolation, especially if things, but that gets the events uh, and creates the fields that uh, we all use in the popular rules. So we can check that upon a certain sequence of events and we get the right, uh, the right uh, fields uh, and uh, the right uh, data. So uh, we also have a feature that was highly requested by our clients. Uh, if a client knows what they're doing, they can actually decide which syscalls and which event they want. This is not, this doesn't translate to command line or training Falco because the client really needs to know what they're doing. Uh, otherwise, we get very consistent results. But our clients, uh, at least the ones in the Falco community that we know, are super smart, so they figured it out easy. Uh, also, uh, speaking about the community, we've got uh, a great ecosystem. We always have products uh, in, and uh, open source projects uh, that use Falco and then integrate with Falco. Our very favorite broker with the Wings, uh, Falco Sidekick, uh, can now uh, send events to even more, uh, even more integrations. So, uh, also, we've got ARM support, uh, we've got uh, policy reports in the CNCF uh, draft format, uh, we've got support for Cosign, thanks to the maintainer of the Cosign project. Uh, it's really growing, and even the UI, that you might be knowing from Southwest Sidekick, is growing a lot because it's been completely rewritten. It's cool as ever. Uh, when, I, when I want to demo Falco, I always use it because I love it. And uh, uh, I have to say that it doesn't have the limitation that the old one had about the number of events per time frame. Uh, then we got a new pub chart. So 
Uh, of course, Helma is used by a lot of us to deploy Cloudflare on Kubernetes. Uh, and by saying new one, I mean that someone just went there and replaced the old Helma with a new one. And uh, this is great because it's got plugin support. As you know, we've got plugins uh, and we need support for it. It's more modern and uh, it should make it uh, easier than ever to deploy Cloudflare in our Kubernetes clusters. And uh, speaking of the ease of deployment, uh, I believe Jason has some updates for us uh, about uh, the very hard task that Paco has to try and support uh, so many different kernels and so many different versions. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Thanks. Time to talk about the kernel crawler. Uh, kernel crawler is a new tool that we added to the ecosystem very recently, which basically crawls for all the new kernel versions supported by many of these Linux distributions at least the ones that we want to support. So the good thing for us is that we can generate priority configurations, which is the kind of information that we use to decide which EDPF uh, probes and kernel modules we need to provide if we need to, uh, to, you know, to install the part of every other privilege that they don't have to provide that money. So before we had that, we needed to actually enlarge the build grid manually every time you could never really ask for it, or every time we had to decide for it, uh, we need a lot now, the kernel crawler is basically uh, helps us automatically keeping up to date this build grid and always have the most up to date kernel versions for all the Linux distributions that we use. You know, with a weekly basis to update the grid. So, this makes Fargo you know, much more easy to install and much more accessible for people. And we provide many, many more uh, pre-built probes. As a matter of fact, we provide too many. So, during the last few years, we actually broke the CI. So, we didn't need to work more. But uh, yeah, there's really a lot. So, Models point here, we store all this information that we crawl in an open database, which is the one you see at the link. And it's basically a source of truth about all the latest kernel versions for each of the distributions that we monitor. And uh, we think it's great because we couldn't find that sort of information on in a single place on the internet when we were looking for it. So if you're interested in working in you know, a similar area, please check out this mm -hmm. one. It may be helpful for you. And uh, this screenshot was taken from one of the websites that I link in the previous slide and basically gives you a hint about how bigger uh, our grid, you know, build grid is. And uh, as you can see, we can now have like multiple architectures, maybe we'll probably more will come in the future. And those are all the distributions that we, we would like to cover and you know we build for every part of these. All of this information is made available to the Falcon Brother Rover, so every time you start Falco, uh, it will look for this. Built and we will try to attend from compiling locally, which is way better for many, many environments uh, in which Fargo is installed. And then there are major updates in the plugin system as well. So we introduced the plugin system back in January, and uh, during the last container track in Valencia, uh, you know, it has been around for only a few months. Now, a plenty of time has been passing, and there's been like major growth in the space. So among all the plugins that we currently support <coughs> officially, I think these are the ones that actually deserve special mention. So the first one is the Kubernetes on the global one, which is a successful porting of what we have in C++ uh, inside Falco into a global plugin. And we also now fully deprecate the old C++ support. Uh, plus, there is a big novelty next to the plugin system, which is that potentially we have different flavors of the same integration. And this is the case, for example, for uh, DKS plugin, which is in development, but what it does is basically using 90% of the code of the brand as a global plugin, but up support for putting events directly from your address infrastructure. So, you know, it saves you the effort to actually communicate with the DKS server and the configuration. There's also a new plugin for GitHub, uh, which is basically able to secure your core organization. Uh, it's able to attach to the plugin uh, to the GitHub platform and then uh, you know, listen for security events. And then you know, that's a secure stuff, for example, like committing a secret in your code repository, which is a good thing, it's growing. Um, then we also you know, improved the plugins that we already had, developed as first ones, which are the Cloudflare one and the Octa one. And to give you like an example of the power of all this, like think about the recent breach from Uber that Shopping is not more than two weeks ago. I mean, the Octa plugin in this case, of course, would have not prevented that, but would that be able to detect that in a very tiny manner, which will be probably better you know, for everyone in that case. And, uh, you know, other than the plugins, the plugin SDK Go has been improving a lot too, and uh, we have like better performance and features as well. And there is a C SDK in the making, which is almost, you know, uh, you're almost ready and almost ready to do this feature. So stay tuned for these changes. Lastly, I would like to dedicate like a few moments on the updates involving our community from a non technical perspective, which we think is just as important as the rest of the updates. Uh, in our path for applying to graduation, 
you know, there's going to be a community effort in reviewing and improving as strength as and the governance of the project. So we try to listen to everyone's voice here, and we improve the cost to be more formal, precise, and exhaustive. Uh, big thanks to the TAC contributor strategy for having helped us all the way, by the way. And uh, among all the others, the major ones are that we cleared up all the walls in the community so that now we have like real definitions for who's the contributor, who are the reviewers, the holders, coordinators, and maintainers. Now there's also like a build up leadership, and it's much more clear how the decision making happens with respect to the goals that I defined before. And then we also have now video spatial paths, uh, consolidated the conflict resolution policies, and we also introduced a formal way basic consensus and when and how it applies to the decision making process. Uh, last but not least, we also formally recognize the status of emeritus maintainers for all the domain experts that used to come into the project, but they no, no longer have time to do that as a, you know, as a form of gratitude for all the great work they've been doing in the past. Now, due to time constraints, uh, we can go over and deeper in all the minor updates, but what we can do is give you a preview of what we expect to have in part of all the next few releases and months. So, the first one, I think, is the, the best one probably, is the awesome work. Uh, that's been happening on the UDF first place orientation led by some, by some of our own uh, community members. Uh, there has been a proposal first in the Lids repository early this year in January to develop from scratch a new UDF probe with the goal of like, uh, using all the modern and cutting uh, features of the technology without any compromise. And then we do that with alongside the roadmap that eventually is something in the, in the future when you know, the old one would not be required anymore. And uh, you know, the features here that we leverage include like an native wing buffer, faster one-way access, and better portability micro read. So yes, the future is maybe the case in which you don't have to build a UDF pros for everyone because it will be already compatible with your system, right? You know, it will and flat for install it. There is, this has been like a very, very active development, and it's a project feature target with what we have in the current model and the old pro, so we're almost ready to roll it out. Bonus point, uh, this came with a native final rate test suite, which basically makes sure that the current instrumentation behaves and performs as expected and should prevent uh, regressions in the future, which is great for all the stakeholders of the project, including other products built on top of this. And uh, early measurements also show that this new growth is sort of more performant than the old one, so it's exciting and I'm looking forward to see that in the next couple of releases. This is a the making file code 0 0.33, but I'm perfectly confident that by the next, eventually the next one again, you will see that at the top. Probably 0.34 is the target. Thank you. And the question is another exciting outcome here. The other less exciting outcome of the future is a way for us to manage our clients and nodes. So before, we only had the, the rules file to deploy it outside the platform. So we had our customers uh, to deploy them in whatever way we wanted. Sure, a copy map could be, could be enough for a uh, Kubernetes, uh, but now things are getting much more complicated because we've got packets that are binaries, uh, multi platform binaries, uh, etc. Et uh, and uh, we've got tools, and sometimes we don't want to deploy rules only when some specific packets are in. And, uh, we, have, we might have multiple custom sets of rules and rules or repositories. So, of course, uh, everyone could write their own script to manage all that, uh, but as a part of the community, we wanted to find have something that is uh, directly from the community and uh, uh, tries to get what uh, to achieve what uh, most people uh, actually want. So, we decided to try and use uh, a tool that already existed, that's called that's called Tato Scale, that's uh, already used uh, to do some administrative tasks for Tato, such as, for example, managing TLS certificates, and we are adding more features to it. So, uh, particularly, this acts uh, as a, a little package manager, and it's able to push and pull uh, packages uh, that contain so rules and packets. When we signed it on the form that this package is with Tato, we, we wanted to have an OCI format, because this way it's just like pulling a Docker in it. OCI is uh, supported directly by uh, the repositories that we might already have installed, uh, both uh, privately or publicly. For example, GitHub packages, uh, uh, you don't need to do anything, uh, it already has support for every type of OCI packages. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have already published uh, all our plugins uh, as a multi platform OCI packages uh, right, uh, in, uh, right from the GitHub organization of the public project. And also, OCI gives us uh, even more features to use in the future, such as support for signing, because we all want to sign our artifacts before uh, loading, you know, arbitrary code into uh, 
uh, something because not to consult around in the cloud. So this allows us to get uh, a much better experience, uh, I think, in, uh, when deploying our own clients. And uh, you might be asking when you will be able to try this. Uh, well, you can try it today because we have a preview of this tool uh, that we have uh, developed over the last uh, several months. And uh, you can uh, directly use this tool uh, to either plug in uh, your own repository or use uh, the bug repository that comes from your team. And uh, it will uh, be able to download the right plugin version from your right uh, architecture. So if you're interested, please go, go ahead and check it out, play with it, uh, tell us what you think. Uh, and uh, if you, if you have one tool, well, this is written in Go. So even if you want to contribute, uh, uh, you are familiar with Go and you want to add features, uh, it would be fantastic. But uh, even if you only want to, to say, hey, I would like this or that feature, we are always uh, the same. So I think we told you a lot of things about, uh, about Falco, and I think there's a lot of exciting things that are happening in the community right now. So uh, I would uh, like to review my uh, to remind you again that uh, you can uh, that you can just sign up for the Falco community. We've got the channel of Slack. We've got a community call every Wednesday, and uh, I would really love to say that the community is open to all and everyone. Although there is one uh, rule, there is one requirement that you have that you are nice and respectful to everyone else and everyone else to work. Uh, if that sounds like you, uh, we can't wait to have you. Thank you. Thank you again for coming and I'll see you all next time.